Okay, a'udhu billahi min ash-shaytani rajim, bismillahi rahman rahim Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah. Dear sisters, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome to the third session of our class, The Life of Aisha radiallahu anha. Uh, last session, we, it was the second session, and we'd started to look at some of the context uh, around the birth of Aisha radiallahu anha. We looked at um, some of the titles that she was given, uh, some of the names. We started introducing her lineage and her family. And we also looked at some of the books um, about the lives of the Sahabiyat that are out there. Um, inshallah, as and when I find more books, uh, because I do have a lot, it's just they're in all different places. Um, I will introduce you to those books, you know, during these sessions, inshallah, and share them with you. If you have anything you'd like to share, please do as well. Uh, while we're waiting for more and more people to join, I'd love to hear from you uh, where, where exactly you're based. So if you could just type in the chat, you know, the, the cities that you're from, the countries that you're in right now. And then we could get an idea of the kind of makeup of this class. Wow, so we've got Oxford. Hello, Oxford. Maldives. London. <laughs> That's where I am right now. West Sussex, UK. Bangladesh, subhanAllah. Uh, Make home USA. I, I have no idea where that is. <laughs> Which state? Is that a state? Uh, I've never heard of that place. Um, Cardiff, good old Cardiff. Germany, subhanAllah. Cardiff, Wales, Port Elizabeth, South Africa. South Africa, my God. SubhanAllah. Uh, Croydon, London, Derbyshire, South London, Philadelphia from the USA, Cardiff, Staffordshire, Saudi Arabia, mashallah, Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, East London, good old East London, <laughs> Cardiff, Wales, London, Jeddah, Saudi Arabia, Michigan. Wow, is that how you pronounce it? Michigan, Michigan. I had a friend from Michigan years ago in Egypt. Wales, Philadelphia, USA, Swansea, Birmingham, London, Essex, Greensboro, USA. Wow. Leighton, good old East London. MashaAllah, that's really amazing. That's just so wonderful to hear, you know, because uh, sitting here in Northwest London, I have no idea where everyone is from. And isn't it amazing that the times in which we live, we can unite in this way. We can literally have a halaqa, an international halaqa. It's, it's amazing, mashallah. Ilford. And the thing that binds us, alhamdulillah, is our, is our deen, our Islam, and our love of Aisha radiallahu anha. So alhamdulillah, may Allah bless this gathering. Thank you so much for sharing that with me. Uh, okay, and without further ado, I will I'll begin the class. So just to tie up some loose ends from last time, um, there was a hadith that we mentioned last time, which was, uh, we were trying to, uh, I was trying to bring a hadith that would show how the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam called Aisha radiallahu anha uh, muwaffaqa, right? Uh, that was one of her sort of nicknames, muwaffaqa, meaning the, the one who has tawfiq, the one who has, uh, you know, who is successful, or who Allah has given success to, or given uh, intelligence, you know, tawfiq to. So in that hadith, uh, somebody asked a question at the end last time. The hadith was um, where the Prophet wasallam had said to Aisha, oh Aisha, whoever from my ummah has two deceased children ahead of him 
Allah will enter him into Jannah because of them. And she asked, uh, she said, I ransom you with my father. And he, it's an expression in Arabic, which means, you know, uh, it's just an expression to say, subhanAllah type expression, right? And what about the one who has one ahead of him? Uh, so one child who has died before them. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, and the one who has one ahead of him, O oh, Muwaffaqa. So he, he called her Muwaffaqa in that instance uh, because of her intelligent question, you know, uh, and her inquisit inquisitiveness, her curiosity, which led her to ask such intelligent questions, right? And then uh, she said, what about the person who has no one ahead of him? Right? No one who has died before them, no child. Then the Prophet Sallallahu said, I will be ahead of the one who has no one ahead of him. Meaning that, and the word in this, in this hadith is farad. So basically farad is like a person, like a scout. The Arabs, when they used to travel, they used to send a scout, a person uh, who on, on a very fast horse, for example, to go ahead of the rest of the, uh, the uh, what is it called, the, the rest of the caravan. Yes, the rest of the caravan, someone to go far ahead to see what's ahead, you know, is there water ahead um, to reach the city that they were heading to before them to prepare the people, etc., etc. So the Prophet ﷺ is using a word in this hadith for the deceased child, uh, which means like a scout who goes ahead of you, right? So it's as if when a person has a child who passes away before them, that person, that, that child is like a scout who's gone ahead, right? Um, and is, has reached where we are all going to reach before, before we have, right? So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and, it, and it's as if that person is like a representative, you see. So that person is like a representative waiting with Allah for their parents. When the parents come, then they will be entered into Jannah uh, because of that person or with that person, right? With that child. Um, and so when Aisha asked, what about a person who has no child who died before them? Then he says, I will be it. I will be that representative for that uh, person who has no one because the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam on the day of judgment you know he will be at the pool of al gawthar he will be the one who is greeting and uh, welcoming his ummah and his followers into jannah right so it's as if he is that representative who went ahead right because he he has passed before us subhanallah so somebody asked last week uh, about this hadith that this deceased ch child, does it have to be, can it be an adult child? And I looked into this and I uh, researched some of the uh, shuruhat, the explanations of this hadith, and this hadith is in Sunan Tirmidhi. And it's actually a child that is under the age of puberty, right? So it's, if a person has a child, has f first it says two children, who uh, passed away before them, then, uh, you know, under the age of puberty, then inshallah, um, and they're patient, of course, then uh, that child will, Allah will cause them to enter Jannah because of that, you know, because of the loss that they experience and the, obviously the difficulty, um, how difficult it is to lose a child. So although that wasn't, strictly speaking, a part of, you know, anything to do with Aisha Radranha. I thought because somebody had asked it last week, um, we should um, address that question and answer it properly. Okay. Um, and what I'm going to do now is I'm going to share my screen. Okay. So can you see this screen, sisters, if you can just let me know. Alhamdulillah, great. So I'm, I'm sure you'll be very pleased that I put together this uh, family tree so that it would be much easier to visualize. So I don't know if you can see my arrow. Uh, this is the first time I'm using screen sharing, so I'm not very familiar with it. But can you see my arrow? Well, okay, my, the mouse. Okay, excellent. 
So this is the, uh, this is just to illustrate uh, how the family tree of Aisha Radilanha met the family tree, meets the family tree of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Okay. So here we have, you can see here, we have the Prophet Ibrahim Alayhi Salam. So of, of course, both the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Aisha Radilanha are descended from Ibrahim Alayhi Salam, right? Um, here we have, so, so there are a number of people between the Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam and Murrah, right? And then at Murrah, uh, this is where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam's family tree meets Aisha's. Because here, I've written here, common ancestor. That is their common ancestor. And you can see that Murrah, he had three sons, Taim, uh, Yazdaqa and Kilab. So the Prophet Sallallahu family are descended from Kilab. So Kilab, Qusay, Abdul Manaf. Uh, Abdul Manaf, he is the one who, you know, he had Hashim. And so Hashim, everyone who descended from Hashim is Banu Hashim, right? They were the Banu Hashim. Abdul Manaf also, if we went off here somewhere, had another had other sons, and one of them is uh, Abd Shams, and then uh, he had Umayyah, and then the Banu Umayyah come from come from there. You see, uh, Banu Umayyah are basically like the family of uh, Abu Sufyan, uh, Uthman, Radila Anhu, etc. Right? That's just to to get to get you to sort of be able to visualize it. Um, and through Abdul Manaf's son Hashim came the Banu Hashim, right? Uh, Abdul Muttalib, Abdullah, and then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So in other words, Murra or Kilab here, and I've written here, look, uh, Abdullah is his father and grandfather, great grandfather is Hashim, great great grandfather is Abdul Manaf, then three times great grandfather is Qusay, four times great is Kilab, so fifth times great is Murra, right? For Aisha radiallahu anha, her father is Abu Bakr Siddiq, of course. Uh, grandfather is Abu Quhafa. Abu Bakr, whose real name is, does anyone know his real name? Can you type it in? Anyone remember Abu Bakr's real name? Abdullah, yes. Abdullah ibn... Abu Quhafa, but Abu, Abu Quhafa also has a real name. Uh, what is his real name? What is Abu Quhafa's real name? Uthman, yes. Okay, so Abu Quhafa is her grandfather. Then great-grandfather Amr, then Amr, then Ka'ab, then Sa'ad, then Taim. And so Mura is her sixth time great grandfather, right? And that's where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Aisha's family trees meet. So I hope that kind of uh, makes it clearer. Would you say that that made it a lot clearer for you guys? And you can take, copy that inshallah. And what I will do is I will ask um, inshallah the team from Al Manar to, to email that to you inshallah. I hope they can do that as a PDF. Um, but, you know, I don't really want us to rely on PowerPoints, okay? Because there is such a thing as death by PowerPoint. And I've experienced that at, at uni myself, you know, like we had this one professor who literally, uh, the PowerPoint is just text and text and text. And he's just literally reading and we're all, you know, our, our eyes are glazing over because, it's very difficult to pay attention to somebody's words when there's a whole load of text on the screen, right? So sometimes, occasionally, when we need something a bit visual like this, I will bring it. But on the whole, I want you to take your own notes, please. Okay. Um, so that's uh, the first thing I wanted to show you. Uh, I wonder if I can share my... Yes. So here's the second diagram I wanted to share with you. Okay, and can you see this? This is basically uh, Aisha or Abu Bakr Siddiq, anhu's four wives, 
the four wives that he had over his lifetime and their children, just to kind of make it clearer. So let's talk about these people in this family tree or in this, um, in this, um, the, the siblings of Aisha radiallahu So first of all, uh, you can see in this diagram, so Abu Bakr, uh, he has his four wives. They were not his wives altogether, right? His first wife was Qutayla bint Abdul Izza. Uh, she was divorced by Abu Bakr. Um, and it's disputed whether she became a Muslim or not. Uh, her mother, sorry, she is the mother of Abdullah and Asma, right? Uh, the two who really helped a lot during the Hijrah, right? Um, okay, and we'll talk more about them in a moment. Then we have his wife, Umm Ruman. Umm Ruman, she married Abu Bakr Siddiq um, after becoming widowed. So she had been married before. Um, she accepted Islam early and she made the Hijrah to Medina. And she passed away during Abu Bakr's life in Medina. And she's the mother of Aisha anha and Abdurrahman, Aisha's, Aisha's full brother, right? Aisha and Abdurrahman. And then we have Asma bint Umais, okay? She uh, is a great Sahabiya. She uh, migrated to Abyssinia and to Medina, so she made two hijras. She was actually married to Ja'far bin Abi Talib, right? Uh, and Ja'far bin Abi Talib, he was killed, or he was martyred during the Battle of Mu'ta, okay? And that is after Umm Ruman had passed away. So Umm Ruman had passed away, uh, Ja'far passed away during the Battle of Mu'ta. And so Abu Bakr married Asma bint Umais. Uh, and later on, we said Asma bint Umais also married Ali bin Abi Talib after Abu Bakr passed away, right? And her son is Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr, the youngest brother of Aisha, radiallahu anha. And we said this Muhammad, he had a son called Qasim bin Muhammad. And that son becomes one of Aisha's important students, right? And one of the great fuqaha of Medina. This Abdul Rahman here, he had a daughter called Amra, okay? And uh, she, Amra bint, bint Abdurrahman, becomes again a great student of Aisha, you see? So, and of course we know Asma had Abdullah ibn Az-Zubayr as her son, right? And Urwa, and they become great students of Aisha as well, right? So you can see a theme there, right? <laughs> MashaAllah. That Aisha Radila and her brothers and sisters, their children were often key students of Aisha Radila and her. And she treated them as her own children because she didn't have children, right? Um, and the last wife of Abu Bakr is Habiba bint Kharija. Okay, Habiba bint Kharija. And... Habiba bin Kharija, she is an Ansariya. She's the only one who's an Ansariya that Abu Bakr married. These three are from the Quraysh, right? They're from Quraysh, Quraysh, and uh, Habiba bin Kharija is from the Khazraj tribe, uh, from Medina, okay? And she's the one who, you know, when the Prophet Sallallahu passed away, Abu Bakr was not in uh, the vicinity of, of the masjid. At that time, he was in her house, right? And she seemed, she lives in uh, the outskirts, I believe, of Medina. Um, and she had a daughter, Umm Kulthum, through Abu Bakr. And this Umm Kulthum was actually born after the death of Abu Bakr, subhanAllah. So uh, Habiba bin Kharja was pregnant, was expecting. Um, when Abu Bakr passed away and Umm Kulthum was born thereafter. So she is the youngest sister of Aisha 
radiyallahu anha. Um, what can we say? Say a little bit more about each of her siblings. Um, start with Abdul Rahman, who's her full brother. He fought with the Mushrikeen in the Battle of Badr. Okay. Um, so initially, he was not on the side of the Muslims. Okay. Um, but then he, when he saw his father in the battle, he changed direction to avoid fighting him. Subhanallah. And Abu Bakr remarked to him later, you know, this was the, you know, you must have heard this famous uh, exchange between them that you know he he told his father Abu Bakr you know I was avoiding you in the battle I was avoiding you in the battle of Badr and Abu Bakr said if I had had an opportunity I would not have spared you subhanallah look at the iman of Abu Bakr you know when his son was against him in the battle um, he said no I would have fought you subhanallah um, he converted to Islam at the time of the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. So that's interesting. Um, I found out that he, during the Battle of Uhud as well, he had thrown down a challenge for, for a duel. You know, at the beginning of the battles, they used to have those duels, just one on one. Um, and when he threw down the challenge for a duel, Abu Bakr had accepted the challenge and uh, the Prophet وسلم, prevented Abu Bakr from doing that, you know, because obviously you know, it, was, it, was not, it was not a good situation. So also he, um, he hid in the house of Aisha. Yeah, this is something that's going to come later on, inshallah. At one point, because he was opposing a decision that uh, Muawiyah uh, ibn Abi Sufyan, the uh, Khalifa after Ali anhu, um, or the Khalifa after, yeah, after Ali anhu, um, because he was opposing him, uh, he had people after him basically, uh, and so Abdul Rahman had to hide somewhere, and he hid in the house of Aisha anhu. We'll find out about that later, inshallah. So that's Abdul Rahman ibn Abi Bakr. Okay, um, just a few things about each of them, so we can kind of contextualize them. Asma bin Abi Bakr. Here, Asma bin Abi Bakr. Uh, she is the daughter of Qutayla. We said she is the wife of uh, Az Zubair, right? Bin Al Awam, one of the ten promised paradise. Okay. Uh, both her husband and one of her sons were companions of the Prophet Sallallahu so Abdullah ibn Zubair. She is known as Dhatun Nitaqain, <clears throat> the owner of the two belts, because why, why is she known as the owner of the two belts? Can someone type that into the chat? Dhatun Nitaqain. Her parents divorced during Jahiliyyah, the age of Jahiliyyah. She was about 10 years older than uh, Aisha, radiallahu anha. Uh, yes, exactly. So sh somebody has written in the chat that she tore her belt into two pieces. So during the hijrah of the Prophet wasallam, she prepared food for Abu Bakr and the Prophet wasallam, And she didn't have anything to tie the food up with so that her brother Abdullah could take it to them, you know, when they were hiding in the cave. So what did she do? Quickly, she took her own waist wrap, so some kind of belt that they would use, you know, to tie their lower garment. Uh, she, she took it off quickly and she tore it into two and she used that to, to wrap the food so that her brother could carry it to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and her father Abu Bakr. And because of that sacrifice and that kind of initiative of hers, the Prophet وسلم, called her Dhat al-Nitaqin and said she would have uh, special, these special belts in Jannah. Um, what else do we know about her? Ten years older than Aisha radiallahu anha. 
Um, she is the mother of many children. Some of her children were Abdullah, Urwa, Al Munzir, Asim, Al Muhajir, Khadija, Umm Al Hassan, and Aisha. So she had lots of children. Uh, she was the last of the Muhajirat to pass away, subhanAllah. So last of the Meccan women who had traveled to Medina to pass away. She lived to the age of a hundred. And it says with all of her teeth intact, subhanAllah. <clears throat> she eventually did divorce uh, or Abu, uh, Abdul, sorry, as Zubair bin al-Awwam, her husband, he eventually divorced her. Uh, and her son Abdullah was a Sahabi and so one of the great blessings of her family of Asma, this Asma's family was that her son Abdullah was the only Sahabi who was Sahabi son of a companion who is Asma who is daughter of a companion who is Abu Bakr right uh, so it says, yeah, there were th that many uh, generations of Sahaba in their lineage. MashaAllah. And so her brother, Abu, uh, her brother Abdullah, he is one of the early Muslims. Okay. So this is her, Asma's full brother, but Aisha's half brother. Abdullah ibn Abi Bakr, he is uh, one of the early Muslims. He is the one who would travel and take provision to the Prophet Sallallahu and his own father in the cave during the Hijrah. Um, he had a wife called Atika, who he really was very much in love with, to such an extent that uh, it seemed like he was neglecting taking part in some of the expeditions, right? Some of the Mazawat. And so Abu Bakr uh, basically told him, you know, this is not good enough. You're neglecting your duties, you know, so I think you should leave this wife of yours. She's distracting you away from, uh, from Allah. And uh, so he was ordered to divorce her by Abu Bakr. But he became so, so sad, Abdullah, that he would write poetry in her praise in, in about his love for this wife of his, Atika. And so when Abu Bakr read or heard, sorry, this poetry, uh, it was so, such sad and heartfelt love poetry that he felt sorry for him. And, you know, he said, okay, take, take your wife back. He was martyred. Uh, due to his injury in the siege of Ta'if, 40 days after the death of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, during the Khilafah of Abu Bakr. Okay. Uh, we said about Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr, the son of Asma, that he, he was not a Sahabi. Well, he was a baby, basically. He was a child when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam passed away. Okay. Um, you know, he, uh, there's a category of Sahaba called the Mukhadram. They are the Sahaba who, they were like too young to remember seeing the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but technically they were born or they were present or the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam saw them. So, you know, uh, they're not the same, obviously, as the Sahaba who had lived with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who had studied with him, who, who accompanied him, of course. And so these, this category of Sahaba are kind of, you could think of them as being the highest level of Tabi'i, right? So the, the generation after the Sahaba, the Tabi'in or the Tabi'un, um, the Mukhadram are like the highest level of those because they were, technically they had, the Prophet ﷺ had seen them, but they don't remember having seen the Prophet ﷺ. So Muhammad bin Abi Bakr is from that category of people, okay? Uh, we said he's the father of Al-Qasim ibn Muhammad. And Al-Qasim was one of the seven famous fuqaha of Medina. 
which we will go into later when we study, when we look at the students of Aisha. He was brought up in the house of Ali bin Abi Talib, we said last time, right? Which is really amazing because, you know, when people try to make out that Ali radiallahu anhu had some kind of animosity with Abu Bakr, you know, and Omar and etc. One of the things, amazing things you'll find is they were all interrelated, you know. Uh, Abu, uh, Ali literally brought up the son of Abu Bakr. He married the widow of Abu Bakr, right? If there was animosity between them, he would not have done that, right? Um, <clears throat> so, and Ali radiallahu anhu really regarded Muhammad as his own son. He made him governor, actually, you know, during his Khilafah. Um, we will see there's some controversial things about Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr. Uh, it seems that he was one of the people who were, I would say, upset with some of the things that were happening in the time of Uthman anhu, in his Khilafah. And uh, there are reports that he was in some way involved in the, uh, the siege of Uthman's house right when his house was being besieged uh, but that he was not was not part of the actual you know killing of Uthman anhu. okay um, during the caliphate of Ali anhu, he was the governor of Egypt and he was killed by one of Muawiyah's men okay Muawiyah bin Abi Sufyan anhu. One of his men, uh, Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr, was killed by him because, of course, uh, he refused to um, to pledge allegiance to Muawiyah. Uh, Muhadram, yeah, we said he is a Muhadram, the highest category of or the highest category of Tabi'in. Um, too young to remember the Prophet uh, but so usually those who are under seven, under the age of seven, they're considered to be Mukhadram, right? And then Umm Kulthum, okay, she, we said she was born after the death of Abu Bakr, Sadiq. She was married to Talha ibn Ubaidillah, one of the 10 promised paradise. And what's really interesting is she had a daughter called Aisha, Aisha bin Talha, right? And uh, this Aisha, later on we'll see, she was also a key student of Aisha radiallahu anha. And people used to, tr used to consider her to be like the secretary, <laughs> secretary or assistant of Aisha radiallahu anha, uh, who is her, basically her khala, right? So, mashallah. So that's an introduction to the context and the family of Aisha radiallahu anha. So these are her two younger siblings. These are, are her older siblings, right? Um, and so she would have, during uh, Umm Ruman's life, uh, Abu Bakr was married to her and then later on he was married to others. So that's just for us to kind of get a bit of an idea of her family. Uh, so let me know in the chat if you if you feel that uh that has helped you know just being able to see that diagram and if it's helped you visualize things okay alhamdulillah that's great alhamdulillah we are visual people okay great um, somebody's saying that the volume is low. Uh, do, you, do you all feel that or is that is the volume okay? Okay, so perhaps the person whose volume is low needs to put their volume up <laughs> at their end. Okay, so alhamdulillah, that's an overview of her brothers and sisters. What time is it now? Okay, alhamdulillah. So we're going to spend the next uh, 10 minutes, inshallah, um, talking about Aisha radiallahu anha's uh, early memories, 
and also her father, you know, because the blessings of Aisha anha, sorry, let me stop sharing now. Okay. I just want to make sure everything is set up fine again. Okay, alhamdulillah. So, the, one of the blessings of Aisha radiallahu anha, or all of the things that we could say that were great about Abu Bakr, Siddiq radiallahu anhu, we could say about Aisha as well, because she grew up in that household, right? And we said that the household that you grow up in has a huge impact on you. So, let's talk about her, her father. Her family was from the nobility, so that also makes a difference, doesn't it? A person who's brought up in a noble family, uh, a family that has status in society, you can kind of tell, you know, by the way Aisha Radilan has spoke, you can tell from the way she has, I would say she had very high self-esteem, right? She seemed very secure. The way she speaks, the way, you know, her eloquence, and her eloquence is uh, an indication as well of her nobility, right? The fact that she comes from a noble family, well-spoken person, right? Um, it all affects, you know, a, pers a person's background affects all of that, doesn't it? Um, her family were wealthy. I think that's something also to take into account because I was thinking, subhanAllah, you know, later on when she became, uh, when she was a widow and she didn't seem to have any kind of attachment, you know, to that wealth that used to come to her. Um, but also it kind of, it's, it's quite interesting that she would have grown up in a house where she wasn't, she wasn't poor at all. You know, she wasn't in need, which might actually explain why some of the wives of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, including Aisha, later on found it quite hard when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam insisted on living such a frugal life, you know? When the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was given a choice between being a king who is a prophet or a messenger who is a slave, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave that choice to the Prophet and he chose to be the messenger who is a slave. What that meant was that the Prophet وسلم, although he had access to wealth, he was on purpose going to live a very, very simple and extra simple and extra frugal life, right? And that had an effect on the wives of the Prophet وسلم, as they saw the rest of Medina and the rest of the community you know, their standard of living increasing and they, they themselves were having to live a very, very simple life. Many of them found that difficult. And I was just reflecting on the fact that Aisha Radiranha came from a wealthy family, you know, where she would not have been wanting for anything, you know, from that time, whatever the norm was of a, of a good life, she would be, have been used to that from a young age, right? Her father being a tradesman, a businessman, a merchant, and from the nobility. So that kind of could explain why somebody like Aisha Radiranha would have found living that life difficult. And inshallah, we're going to go into that later and we'll see that. You know, although she did find it difficult initially, um, when she was given the choice by the Prophet وسلم, to choose between staying with him and living a very simple life, or being given a lot of wealth and being allowed to go, she chose to live with the Prophet Sallallahu She chose the frugal life and she chose the akhirah. Uh, but this kind of explains why, you know, somebody like her would have found that life difficult. Um, she says, I never knew my parents except as practices of the deen, meaning except as religious people, right? So Aisha Radiranha was born into a household where her parents were already Muslim. 
her half brother and sister were already Muslim as well, right? Um, some scholars say Aisha radiallahu was the 19th person to become Muslim, okay? Um, and there were companions in four generations of Aisha radiallahu's family. Yeah, we already mentioned that, right? About Abdullah bin Zubair, especially. Um, during the era of the companions, it would be said, okay, this is what they said about the house of Abu Bakr, that Iman, faith, has its households, and hypocrisy has its households. One of the households of Iman among the Muhajirun is the household of Abu Bakr. And this is uh, Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah, he mentions this in Minhaj al-Sunnah. Okay, so it was a household of Iman. Again, this has an impact on Aisha anha and the way she was brought up. Her paternal grandfather, Uthman, who is Abu Quhafa, right? Uthman bin Amr, bin Amr, known as Abu Quhafa, embraced Islam on the, during the conquest of Mecca. So he embraced Islam much later. Uh, Zarka, she mentions that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam married no other woman whose parents both made hijrah other than Aisha. And she was distinguished also by the fact that her father and grandfather were companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Okay, her paternal grandmother, so Abu Quhaf's wife, Abu Bakr's mother, Salma bint Sakhr ibn Amr, known as Umul Khair. She embraced Islam during the early stage of da'wah, okay, and she died, so she embraced Islam before her husband, and uh, she died during the Khilafah of her son Abu Bakr. So Aisha's father Abu Bakr, of course, he had a huge impact on her personality, right? Um, he was the first man to embrace Islam. He was the greatest man after the prophets. He was the best man from the Ummah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now, when you know that your father is that, that has an impact on you. It makes you feel you have to behave a certain way. You must have a certain standard, right? Um, Abu Bakr never bowed down to an idol, nor drank a drop of alcohol before in his life, nor free marital relations. And that's amazing for that time, right? That is amazing for that time because... These things were normal for people, right? Buying to idols, drinking alcohol, having premarital relations, it was not anything. It was not seen as anything in those times. And yet Abu Bakr Siddiq, of his own volition, right? Had stayed away from those things. And that shows you also how similar he was to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, right? You know, uh, birds of a feather flock together. This is why you can see that they had such a good relationship and such a bond, right? That they were very similar in that they had naturally, they had, in their fitrah, they, they were drawn away from these fawahish and, you know, evil deeds and things like that. Her father used to free slaves and help the oppressed of Mecca. He spent his wealth and life for the sake of Islam, Siddiq. He was the first caliph as well, we know that. He was the closest companion to the Prophet ﷺ and one of the two in the cave mentioned in the Quran. He was a wealthy businessman. He spent his time and wealth calling to Islam and freeing Muslim slaves. His home was a center of Islamic activity. SubhanAllah, I love that image, you know, of a home that is buzzing with Islamic activity. Um, and you know, that's, that's it. It's, brothers and sisters or sisters, you know, I feel that we as Muslim women, we need to make our homes like that, centers of Islamic activity. You know, we don't need lots and lots of organizations. We need our homes, we need our families to become those hubs of da'wah, those hubs of, you know, um, activity. Uh, when there's somebody who, uh, a non-Muslim who needs to be invited to Islam, it's our homes that should be open to them. Right on Eid, when there are um, new Muslims who need support, 
It's our homes that should be open to them. Uh, there are so much we can do from our homes. And I just love this image of Abu Bakr and Aisha and his family life being a home, you know, full of Islamic activity. And one of the narrations, and inshallah we will end with this and then have Q&A, the a long narration where Aisha radiallahu anha describes um, how Abu Bakr Siddiq set out, actually initially when there was persecution in Mecca, he actually set out to go to Abyssinia. He had intended to make hijrah to Abyssinia. And this hadith really sums up the kind of household she grew up in, right? So I want to read it to you on the translation. So uh, Ibn ad daghina who is uh, one of the people in Mecca, he saw Abu Bakr setting out to migrate to Habasha, right? To migrate to Abyssinia. And he was really alarmed by this because, you know, when you see the best people in your society leaving, you think, what's going on, you know? Uh, there's something wrong, it's not fair, it's not right, this shouldn't be happening. So he went, uh, he said to Abu Bakr, he said, no, 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 don't leave, don't leave. He said, I will protect you. I will give you uh, this system that they had, you know, at the time where somebody can lend their protection or asylum or some kind of, um, it was like a type of asylum, you know, that, okay, you are, you are under my protection and if anyone has any issue, they have to come to me, right? So Ibn Dagina said that he would give him that protection. And he went to the Quraysh, the dignitaries of Quraysh, and he said to them, he was very upset. He said, look, a man like Abu Bakr should not leave his homeland, nor should he be driven out. Do you, Quraysh, drive out a man who helps the destitute, who, who, uh, provides their living for them, who keeps good relations with his kith and kin, who helps the weak and poor, who entertains guests generously and helps the calamity-stricken people. Subhanallah. And so it says, the people of Quraysh could not refuse Ibn al-Daghina's protection. This hadith in Bukhari. And it goes on. Quraysh endorsed Ibn al-Daghina's covenant of protection, known as Jiwar, right? type of uh, asylum or protection, ensuring safety, provided that Abu Bakr would only worship Allah indoors, right? So that was their condition, that Abu Bakr is not allowed to pray in public, okay? Later, Abu Bakr made like a musalla in his own home, right? Uh, like a masjid or a musalla, not like a big masjid, but just he set aside a, a, a part of his home as a masjid, and so he would be praying and people could see him, okay? And Quraysh began to fear, and it says in the hadith that the sun, that their sons might become attracted, okay? And asked Ibn al daghina to stop Abu Bakr from doing so, okay? So they saw, what, what would happen is Abu Bakr would stand in prayer and, you know, he was so emotional and he was so, like, his salah, and this is one of the amazing things, you know, when a person of Iman, a person of Abu Bakr's status, when they pray, their salah is awe-inspiring. Their connection to Allah is so awe-inspiring that people would start, stop and watch, right? And so uh, Quraysh got worried that, oh my God, he's attracting the youth, you know, he's attracting the women and the youth. Right? Attracted to Islam because of Abu Bakr. So they went to Ibn al-Daghina and they said, Oh, you know, you promised us, they said, you promised us that if we would give, if we would allow him to stay and, and allow him your protection, then he would not pray in public. So Ibn al went to Abu Bakr's house and he said, look, he said, I gave you, he said, I gave you my covenant. So either you commit to this or give me back my jiwar, give me back my, uh, covenant of protection. He said, because I don't want the Arabs to hear that I reneged on a covenant I gave to any man. Okay. So Ibn al daghina said to Abu Bakr, Abu Bakr said to Ibn al daghina I should say, Abu Bakr said to Ibn al daghina he said, take back your jiwar, 
take back your jiwar. I'm satisfied with the protection of Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. That was Abu Bakr Siddiq's reply, right? Subhanallah. You know, what an amazing man. What an amazing man. So <clears throat> I think there's a lesson in that for us as well, you know, us living in the West. One of the things you sometimes hear people say is, you know, in order to protect our rights, in order to ensure our rights, in, in order to ensure that we... narrative that sometimes you hear people saying you know we have to collaborate with certain groups certain lobby groups who have agendas that are un-islamic right and we have to maybe compromise a little bit we might have to support them a little bit in their work right because we need their support we need their protection we need their support but their support comes with strings attached right that's the problem. Their support comes with strings attached. And those strings are against our values. So I think this example of Abu Bakr Siddiq shows us that actually we, instead of considering all these different groups, all these different people of power as being our protectors, dear sisters, we should rely on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as our ultimate protector, right? And, and subhanAllah, it's quite sad to see because before we have even really, you know, may Allah protect us all, but before we have even really had to suffer anything in the West, right? We're willing to give up on some of our principles and our values in order to seek some kind of protection from other human beings, right? No, the biggest downfall for us will be our sins our biggest downfall will be us being separated from our principles, from not obeying Allah. That is the thing that causes us harm. But if we make Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala number one in our lives, if we really believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is our protector, then we can never lose. We can never lose. Because even when we are persecuted, may Allah protect us from that. And we are winners. Right, even if we have to die for Allah's sake, right? There are many who've died before us, there are many who have suffered before us, and many, many who are suffering today in the world because of their deen, because of saying, La ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah. Are they losers? No, ultimately, they are winners because this life is not the life, the goal, the goal of this life is not to live in comfort right and i know it's hard to say and i'm not wishing any difficulty upon us but what i'm saying is that even before the the smallest amount of persecution has hit us are we so easy and so ready to give up our principles when look at abu bakr siddiq he was facing real persecution he was facing real persecution and he said to a man who didn't who, who wouldn't allow him to pray in in public he said to him, take back your protection. I'm satisfied with the protection of Allah. SubhanAllah. So, dear sisters, inshallah, with that we will wrap up for today. And next time we will talk about the hijra of Aisha, anha, her early memories, how she married the Prophet وسلم, and some of the issues or questions surrounding her marriage to the Prophet wasallam. Subhanak Allahumma wa bihamdik ashadu wa la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. Inshallah, we'll look at the questions now. If you have any questions or comments. Aha. Any tips on how we can make our homes the center of Islamic activity? Okay. Well, I think one of the things I witnessed with my own parents is we actually moved house quite a lot during our childhood, you know, and it used to, after a while, it kind of annoyed me a bit right, that we, we would keep moving because whenever we moved, we would start in a new school and a new 
obviously you had to get used to a new area, et cetera, et cetera, right? But looking back, I can actually see the benefit of that because wherever we moved, my parents were, my mom would gather the children of that area. She would invite them and teach them Quran, right? Um, my father would answer their questions. He would be the one who establishes a masjid or be, is involved in the establishing of a masjid in the area or inviting imams, you know, and uh, allowing there to be qualified imams present uh, in each masjid. Um, they would teach us when we went to school, we would talk about Islam, you know, it was something natural to us. So that's just a little example of how a family can be like a center of Islamic activity, right? Whatever it is that your talents are, whatever it is that your community and your locality needs, we as Muslims should not be waiting for some organization to fulfill that need. We should be fulfilling that need, right? So whether it means reaching out to your neighbors, you know, giving them gifts, giving them, a, baking them a cake, right? And giving them some dawah material, uh, whether it means starting some kind of project from your home that each of your children can take part in, right? Uh, whether it means making sure that your children know about their deen, have a strong relationship with Allah, such that when they go out into the world, they themselves are beacons of light. Yeah, wherever they go. Um, I think it's for each and every one of us to identify the needs of our local community. What kinds of things could we do in our locality that would bring people together, uh, that we could invite people to Islam through, you know, um, and that we could solve problems of the local community such that people would be attracted and wanting to engage with us, right? We can't, as Muslims, live in ghettos. We can't live in silos, you know completely shut off and thinking, no, we're only going to mix with our own, we're only going to mix with other Muslims, right? That's not how it's supposed to be. Um, I hope that's given you some ideas. Sorry, can you please repeat the part about what they worried about? Mm, what they worried about? Somebody's answered, they were worried that the youth and women in society would be attracted to Islam by seeing Abu Bakr pray with such khushur. Yeah. And isn't it funny that that's exactly the worry of people who hate Islam today, right? <laughs> you know, they're always worried. You can tell they're worried that women will be attracted to Islam because of the amount of demonization that the topic of women in Islam gets, right? Wallahi, sisters, if women knew uh, what Islam would give them, the gifts that Islam gives them, a relationship with their creator, a good relationship with men, an understanding of their position in society, uh, the ability to embrace their femininity, right? To not be a commodity. All of these things, right? To have a real status as mothers, as women, to be supported and protected from the cradle to the grave. These are some of the gifts that Islam gives to women. If the wider women, if women in wider society knew the reality of what it is to be a Muslim woman, they would embrace Islam. They would embrace Islam. And I think that is why one of the reasons why those who dislike Islam, who don't want it to spread, who see it as a negative thing, are always demonizing the topic of women, women in Islam because they don't want women to be attracted. And again, they don't want youth to be attracted, right? So they make religion and Islam in particular look as though it's backward, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? And yet, subhanAllah, who are the majority of people converting to Islam? In the UK, it seems to be women and it seems to be young people. <laughs> so, please. What was the name of the man who tried to prevent Abu Bakr from praying in public? I mean, Ibn Daghina, he's the one who gave Abu Bakr protection. And 
the dignitaries of Quraysh, the, the leaders of Quraysh, they saw that he was praying in public and they told Ibn al daghina tell him to stop because you are the one who's responsible for protecting him. You're like his, uh, I would say, his representative, right? And so, you know, you've got to stop him. So it was like that. Asma, Asma, that was a mushrika. It seems that she was and that she died upon that. Uh, it's not very clear. But yeah, she was. And remember, Asma was the one who came and asked, is it okay for her to, you know, welcome her mother and have good relations with her mother? And the Prophet ﷺ said, yes, she should. Um, sister is asking, is it okay if we conduct a class with our friends on what we have been, what you have taught today? Of course. That's, I would love you to do that. You know? Um, and that's what we should do, you know? When we seek knowledge, do your, a bit of your own research as well. Uh, make it solid, make it, you know, more concrete, and then convey uh, that knowledge, especially the things that you are sure about. Like my father, when I first started out giving talks and stuff, I would ask him, like, you know, what things, what kind of topics should I stick to and avoid? And one of the things he said to me is, which is great advice, he said, you know, talk about the things that everyone agrees upon, the scholars agree upon. Don't be a person who brings up all the controversial things that cause divisions between the Muslims, yeah? So the things that we, we know about the deen, uh, you know, and especially things like the seerah, especially, you know, Islamic history, um, without causing fitna and without, you know, bringing up things that there might be difference of opinion on that will cause problems. We should, we should do that, you know. Okay, so uh, that question that the sister asked, challenges fa you face while rearing children Islamically? There are many challenges, you know. I don't think the challenges end. Um, you know, the fact is that the great thing is, dear sisters, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not burden us, you know, with, with more than we are able to do. So when we do our best as parents, when we make sure that we are doing our part, we're setting a good example, we're following the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we are teaching our children the things that Allah has told us to teach them. We, we've given them love, we've given them a loving home, uh, an environment in which their iman can thrive. We've helped them to have good friends, you know, good social circle, um, or, you know, made sure they have good schooling, where they have good mentors, etc., etc. If we've done all those things, we've taught them Quran, you know, we've, we've done our best, then the result is in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's hands, right? We're not responsible for being the guiders. Of course, all of us want our children to be guided, but we're not responsible for the end result. Well, our responsibility is to do the due diligence, right? So I think some of the challenges are challenges such as the media, challenges such as the internet, um, keeping children focused, you know, as, as they get older. Um, uh, avoid, helping them avoid being confused by Muslims who are not very practicing, for example. Um, but I think the main thing, the most important thing that we as mothers can do is to connect our children with Allah. You know, if you can connect your children with Allah by making dua with them so they know how to talk to Allah, by talking to them about Allah, by showing them how a person relates to Allah in your own example, in your own life, you know, when they see the way you react to certain things, then what you will see is that they will develop a bond with Allah such that even if you're not there, they'll know how to connect with Allah. They'll know how to talk to Allah, right? And that's something that nobody will be able to take away from them, no matter what kind of situation they're in, right? Inshallah.
is this class open to all? Yes, it is. It is open to all. Um, you can share every, every week when you get the link, you can share it with as many people as you want. Okay. So please do share it with everyone. Uh, did Aisha have any half siblings with her mother? Yes, she did. And I don't have their names with me, unfortunately. But yeah, she, because her mother was married before, she had siblings from that as well. I think that's pretty much everything. One sister says, children learn from what you are more than what you teach. <laughs> that's true, you know, subhanAllah. It is true, because just think about your own parents, right? There are amazing things that our parents used to do that we just observed them do. Not, we didn't necessarily hear them preach about it, right? Assalamu alaikum. For the very informative session and for answering all the questions that have been asked. Um, we ask Allah to reward you and Jazakallah Khairan to everyone for joining us. I know it's a time of Eid that we spend with our family, but it's really important for us to keep our souls nurtured, inshallah, with some Islamic knowledge along the way. So Jazakallah Khairan to everyone and inshallah we look forward to seeing you next Sunday. Insha'Allah. So, Jazakumullah khairan, you know, everyone, I'm, I love your messages and it's so nice. It's so amazing to, to know that everyone is like joining us from all around the world, you know, that's, that's just great. And I would love it, sisters, if you would invite other sisters, you know, to your homes, maybe make this a halaqa every week where you invite them, you have this uh, on a big screen, maybe, you know, and uh, allow other sisters that's one way you can make your home a center of Islamic activity, right? By opening your doors. Um, so Jazakumullah khairan. Inshallah, next week we will carry on. And uh, we hopefully will reach the stage of the Hijrah and at least, you know, uh, the beginning of Medina uh, next time. So with that, Inshallah, I will leave you. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Ashadu wa la ilaha illa anta astaghfirka wa atubu ilayk. Eid Mubarak and Salaamu Alaikum Taqabbal Allah minna wa minkum Salaamu Alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh